Part 1. First, you have some time to look at questions 1 to 6. Excuse me, I want to ask you about the charges for meals. Are they the same as they were last year? No, I'm afraid they're not. We've managed to keep most of them the same, but we've had to increase the charge for breakfast. How much is it now? It's $2.50. It used to be $2. I see. What about lunch? It's unchanged. Still $3. Does dinner still cost $3? Yes, it does. We've managed to keep the prices down this year. But the best deal is the three-meal plan for $48 per week. We give you vouchers to present when you come into the cafeteria, and you get 21 meals for your $48. That works out to a little more than $2 a meal. The two-meal plan is also at last year's rates of $36 per week. We give you vouchers for that, too. My sister was in this hostel before me. I'm sure the hours for breakfast used to be longer. Yes, they were. They used to be 7 to 9.30. But to keep our expenses down, we made them 7 to 9. Lunch is the way it was, though. Hold on. Dinner, 6 to 7.30. Isn't that a change? Yes, it is. And in fact, the form is wrong. It used to be 5.30 to 7.30, but now it's 6 to 8 p.m. 6 to 8 p.m. That's good. So, which plan would you like? I'd like to think about it, please. I need to check my lecture schedule. Before you hear the rest of the conversation, you have some time to look at questions 7 to 10. Can you tell me how to get to my room, please? Of course. You're in the new wing, which is very freshly painted and pleasant. But I'm afraid you're going to have to go to a couple of other offices before you can have the key. You're in the admissions office now. Leave this office and turn right and go to the end of the hall. The last office is the fees office, where you can pay the balance of your room deposit. They'll give you a receipt. OK. After you've been to the fees office, come back past admissions. You'll see a very large room at the northwestern corner of the building. You can't miss it. That's the student lounge, and if you go in there, you can meet some of the other students and see who'll have a room near you. That's good. Can I get a cup of coffee there? Yes, there's a vending machine in the corner. Then go to the key room, which is opposite the lift and next to the library. Show them your receipt and you can pick up your key there. My luggage was sent on ahead. Do you know where I should collect it? The box room is next to the women's toilet. You'll have to get the key from the key room. Thank you. That is the end of part one. You now have half a minute to check your answers. Now it turns to part two. Part two. You will hear a talk about a pool and outdoor venue created by some people. First, you have some time to look at questions 11 to 14.
Hey, if you're just joining us on WKPX The Sound, welcome. We're here in the studio with Matt and Cam in the morning, and this morning we're talking about keeping the kids occupied on summer vacation. Folks, there's a new kid in town in the world of summer fun. Get ready for the Pool of the People, a pool and outdoor venue created by, that's right, the people. Scheduled to open in November, the ideas for everything from the design of the pool right down to the items sold in the snack bar have been decided upon by a sample of 1,050 members of the public. The public selected two top proposals from over a dozen created by renowned architect Ned Mosby, and the final design is truly something else. The pool is shaped like a fishbowl, sinking down into the ground, and there's, you guessed it, a real live fish tank in the center. It's certainly the center of attention in the Bridgewater area. Now, you are probably wondering how much an extravagance like this must cost, right? Well, have no fear. At just £15 for adults and £10 for kids, it's an affordable way to entertain the kids in those dog days of summer. The only problem now is the possibility that it will in fact become too popular. The pool is only so large, so swarms of people coming to enjoy it may cause quite a crowd in its first summer of opening. There will be an opening party for a select audience, and in line with the pool's mission, the people have decided on all the arrangements. They collectively decided on actress Rebel Wilson to host in the festivities scheduled for later this month, and even dictated the playlist by ranking their top ten songs from a list of hundreds. There is some discrepancy, however, on the sculpture design for the foyer at the entrance. The people elected a jellyfish sculpture to greet entering visitors, but given last week's vicious attack by a box jellyfish on a local youth, coordinators fear it will bring too much fear to patrons. Before you hear the rest of the talk, you have some time to look at questions 15 to 20. The theme of the clubhouse is set to be International Waters, with a different section representing each continent, designed by the legendary local artist Roberta Anuzzi. Representing Asia in the reception area will be a mosaic made up of prominent animals indigenous to the continent, a camel, a panda, and the Siberian white tiger, to name just a few. In the West Lounge, feel the cool, icy vibes of the Transantarctic Mountains of Antarctica. Makes you cold just thinking about it, doesn't it? Just seeing a wall with a mural of the glacial mountains is almost enough to cool you off on a December afternoon. Almost. Why not make the trip to the pool a social studies lesson at the same time? The theme in the ladies' lounge room for Africa may not be what you expected. A safari? Drum music? The Nile River? No. Did you know that Africa was home to the first jewellery? I sure didn't. By contrast, as you may expect, North America's theme for the card room is as modern, even futuristic, as it gets. Anuzzi created for North America a sort of absurdist print, interestingly juxtaposing the moon landing of 1969 with an abstract depiction of humans living on Mars. Seems to me like an interesting commentary on the future of space exploration. And in the men's lounge room, the ancient forts of Sparta, Rome, Greece and other European civilizations fittingly exhibit the strength and combatant characteristics of these societies. Finally, the cafe and breakfast room area is an enchanting round room that draws all attention to its center, where there is a strikingly realistic sculpture of a volcano. The delicious food may actually be only the second most exciting part of this room in comparison to the nine-foot statue 
complete with brightly colored molten lava to characterize South America. Honestly, it is like a museum visiting each room of the clubhouse. Why not make the trip to the pool an educational one for the kids? We're going to take a quick commercial break here at WKPX, but we'll be back in 10 with more on what's touted to be the summer's hottest place to beat the heat. That is the end of part two. You now have half a minute to check your answers. Now it turns to part three. Part three. You will hear two geography students talking. An older student called Howard is giving advice to a younger student called Joanne on writing her dissertation. First, you have some time to look at questions 21 to 24. Hi, Howard. I haven't seen you for a while. Oh, hi, Joanne. Yeah, they're keeping us really busy on the postgraduate programme. Mm -hmm. But how are you? You'll be starting your dissertation soon, won't you? Yeah, tutorials start next week. I've got Dr Peterson. You'll remember it all from last year, of course. Oh, it's not something you forget easily. <laughs> <laughs> but seriously, although I didn't expect to enjoy writing my dissertation, and in fact I didn't really find it much fun, mm. I wouldn't have missed the experience. I found it really improved my understanding of the whole degree programme, you know, from the first year on. Right. So what are you doing yours on? Glaciated landscapes. Although I haven't decided exactly what aspect yet. Mm, I did mine on climate systems, so I can't help you much, I'm afraid. <laughs> <laughs> but you'll be fine once you start your tutorials. Dr Peterson will help you focus. I know, and he'll set me deadlines for the different stages, which is what I need. My concern is that I've got tons of material on the topic, and I won't be able to stick to the word limit, you know. Mm, I remember I had different concerns when I was doing my dissertation. Last year? Yeah. Before my first tutorial, I did a lot of fairly general reading because I hadn't fixed on my topic at that stage. Mm. I actually enjoyed that quite a lot and really improved my reading speed, you know. So I was getting through a lot of material. I was frightened I wouldn't remember it all, though, so I got into the habit of making very detailed notes. So, did you find your tutor helpful in getting you started? Yeah, we certainly had some interesting discussions, but it's funny, I saw a brilliant programme about climate change, and it was that that really fired me up. Mm. It was talking about some recent research which seemed to contradict some of the articles I'd been reading. Mm. Now you have some time to look at questions 25 to 30. So you say your tutorials start next week? Yeah. Well, the first month's crucial. You've got to meet your tutor and decide on your focus, but don't become too dependent on him. You know, don't see him every week, only when you want to check something. Right. Once you've got the focus, you've got to get reading. Mm. It's helpful to look through the bibliographies for all the course modules relating to your topic and get hold of any books you think you'll need. I haven't got much money. I mean, get the books from the library. Far better. 
And I suppose I should prepare a detailed outline of the chapters. Yeah, absolutely. But don't feel you have to follow it slavishly. It's meant to be flexible. Okay. Now, I'm someone who likes to get writing quickly. I can't just sit and read for a month. <laughs> Not like me, then. <laughs> But if that's what suits you, you know, your natural approach, then you really ought to start immediately and write the first chapter. Right. Now, Joanne, about the library,、mm. it's worthwhile getting on good terms with the staff. They aren't always helpful with undergraduates. I suppose they focus on postgrads more.、Mm, maybe. But show them you're serious about wanting to do good work. And what if I can't find what I need? Well, there's interlibrary loans. Borrowing books from other libraries, but I've heard it isn't all that reliable.、Mm, you're right, but you probably won't need it anyway. Be positive. <laughs> the library is likely to have most things you need, and during the dissertation writing period, you can take out fifteen instead of the usual ten books. Should I look at previous year's dissertations? You can do, but I won't know which are the good ones. The library only keeps the best, and the staff can advise you. Are they willing to do that? Oh yeah. And I'm worried about getting journal articles from the electronic library. Well, have you tried to find any yet? No. Well, you should. It's really straightforward. That's obviously something I'll have to look into. Doctor Peterson will help. Yeah, I know I can go to him if I have any worries. Except he will be away in the second month.、Oh. It's the holidays. You should ask him what to do while he's away. Gosh, yeah, but I suppose I can get a lot of support from coursemates. I know a couple of people who are thinking of doing the same topic as me. Take care. Collaboration can become dependency. I think you'd better see how that works out. What the people are like. You're probably right. About other reading, I suppose Dr. Peterson will recommend plenty of good articles to get me started. One thing I'd find out is what his attitude is to internet sources. Surely not in this day and age. I'd better get that sorted out right at the beginning. I would if I were you. And I've also got some questions about the research sections. How much time I should spend explaining the process? Well, I think that's up to you. You can see how it develops as you're writing. Okay. It's the same with things like time management. That's something a tutor can't really help you with. I agree. So, is there anything else you need me to go over? That is the end of part three. You now have half a minute to check your answers. Now it turns to part four. Part four. You'll hear a lecture about Iron Age in Britain. First, you have some time to look at questions thirty-one to forty. Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. Today, I am going to introduce to you a special age in Britain, the Iron Age. People at that time—you may be surprised to hear that—seem close to the men and women of today because archaeologists discovered that they tried to vary their diet, improve their homes, and follow fashions. 
The period known as the Iron Age lasted in Britain for about 800 years, from 750 BC to 43 AD. There had been several dramatic changes by the end of the Iron Age, including coinage, wheel-thrown pottery, etc. People had started to live in larger and more settled communities. Furthermore, because of the differences in climate and geography, someone living in Yorkshire or Ireland would have eaten different food, worn different clothing, and lived in different housing conditions from someone living in southern Britain. Caesar commented that Britain was a land of small farms, and this has been proven by the archaeological evidence. Since Iron Age society was primarily agricultural, it is safe to presume that the daily routine would have revolved around the maintenance of the crops and livestock. Small farmsteads were tended by and would have supported isolated communities of family or extended family size. They produced enough to live on and a little extra to exchange for commodities that the farmers were unable to provide for themselves. For those farms, harvested crops were stored in either granaries that were raised from the ground on posts or in bell-shaped pits two to three meters deep. Some four thousand five hundred of these storage pits have been found within the hill fort interior at Danebury in Hampshire, and if they were all used to store crops. This would have essentially made the site one large fortified granary. Although the archaeological evidence shows that cattle and sheep would have been the most common farm animals, it is known that pigs were also kept. The animals would have aided the family not only with heavy farm labor in the case of the cattle, such as the plowing of crop fields, but also as a valuable form of wool or hide and food products. Horses and dogs are also observed in the archaeological evidence from both faunal remains and artifacts. Horses were used for pulling two or four-wheeled vehicles, carts, chariots, while dogs would have assisted in the herding of the livestock and hunting. Besides agriculture and stock raising, the architecture in Iron Age is also worth mentioning. A very well-preserved settlement has been discovered at the site of Chiselster in Cornwall. It was made up of individual houses of stone with garden plots. In Wessex, the typical building on a settlement would have been the large round house. All of the domestic life would have occurred within this. The main frame of the round house would have been made of upright timbers, which were interwoven with coppiced wood, usually hazel, oak, ash, or pollarded willow, to make wattle walls. This was then covered with a daub made of clay, soil, straw, and animal manure that would weatherproof the house. The roof was constructed from large timbers and densely thatched. The main focus of the interior of the house was the central open hearth fire. This was the heart of the house to provide cooked food, warmth, and light. Because its importance within the domestic sphere, the fire would have been maintained twenty-four hours a day. Beside the fire may have stood a pair of fire dogs, such as those found at Baldock in Herefordshire, or suspended above it a bronze cauldron held up by a tripod and attached with an adjustable chain. The ordinary basic cooking pots would have been made by hand, from the local clay, and came in varying rounded shapes, occasionally with simple incised decorations. As for eating, bread would have been an important part of any meal. And was made from wheat and barley. The dough would have then been baked in a simple clay-domed oven, of which evidence has been found in Iron Age houses. The barley and rye could also have been made into a kind of porridge. In addition to this, the grain was also fermented to make beer, and the surface foam that formed was scraped off and used in the bread-making process. The interior of the house was an ideal place for the drying and preservation of food. Smoke and heat from the constant fire would have smoked meat and fish, and would have dried herbs and other plants perfectly. Salt was another means of preserving meat for the cold winter months, but this was a commodity that could not be made at a typical settlement. Well, you can see that Iron Age people lived a decent life, didn't they? I'm going to introduce their culture and leisure time next time. Thank you. That is the end of part four. You now have half a minute. To check your answers.